While I was in middle school, I would wake up early and walk up to the school to hang out with my friends. The doors wouldn't open until around 7.15 a.m., so we just hung out right outside. One of the days, I left my backpack outside. I didn't remember until halfway through my first class. It was art, so I didn't need anything from my backpack. The teacher allowed me to go outside to get it, and before I went back into the school, I rummaged in my bag to make sure everything was there. While going through some things, I noticed a piece of paper with some handwriting on it that wasn't mine. I can only assume that this person used the paper that was readily available in my pack, which obviously means that they were going through it. I don't quite remember what was written, but I do remember that the K-I-S-S-I-N-G song was written, except kissing was replaced with fucking. I assumed that it was a male because they gave a male name. Then it detailed things that he wanted to do with me, like touching me, and I even remember my address on there in the statement, I'm going to come for you soon. It quite honestly terrified me. I didn't know what to do. I'd never really been told what to do in that situation. All I'd ever been taught was that if someone was touching me, I should tell someone. I didn't know if I should ignore it or tell. It's quite obvious now what I should have done, but I was only 11 or 12 at the time, and I didn't really think about it. The thought that someone was trying to scare me, a tactic to make me not forget my backpack again, crossed my mind. I realize now that only someone sick or sadistic would have done that. If an actual responsible adult had found it, I most likely would have been lectured and told not to forget it. But I'm rambling, and there's more to the story. I didn't tell anyone. Stupid, I know, and it was for a stupid reason. I didn't want to get into trouble, and I thought that if I told someone, I would get into even more trouble than I would have if I had not gotten the note. I don't know where I got my reasoning. Anyway, a few days went by. One would think that I would have forgotten about it, but I agonized over it. Thinking about it made me physically ill, and even now just thinking about it gives me a sick feeling. I was afraid of whoever this person was, and what would happen if someone found out. I kept the note, actually hid it somewhere in my room. I don't know why. My sister and I shared a room and our beds were on either side of a big window. She liked the blinds to be open so that she could see outside because she liked looking at the night sky. The window was always locked though. It had rained that day, but whatever clouds had been there were gone. The rain is important though. I'm a pretty light sleeper and woke up to a rustling noise. Sometimes animals would get really close to the house, so I didn't think anything of it. I looked up at the window and saw a man wearing a mask, like one would wear during Halloween, staring back at me. I screamed. I scrambled off my bed, still screaming. My sister woke up and started screaming as well whether because I was screaming and I startled her, or she saw him too, I don't know. But as soon as we started screaming, he turned and started running away from the house. My parents came into the room, the light went on, but my sister and I kept crying. It took a while for them to calm us down enough to get an explanation, and by that time, the man was well and truly gone. My dad called the police and with our help gave them a description when they came. They took a look outside and said that someone had been standing right outside my window. I think it was because it was slightly muddy that they could tell. His shoes had probably made an indent in the mud. There were apparently tracks leading up to and from the house as well. I still didn't tell anyone about the note. I know I should have but I didn't. I'm pretty sure though that the guy who wrote the note was the guy who was peeping through my window. The police couldn't find anything else and told my dad that if he saw anything weird to give them a call. 
I'm not sure if he was finished with me, and I never will, because shortly after we moved for unrelated reasons. I'm assuming the guy never found out my new address, as there weren't any other creepy encounters. So, dude who creeps on little girls, let's not meet. Ever. Back in September, the 29th I think, my mom gets a call from a guy who said something like, I did something really bad. My mom asked the guy what he did, and he said that he was in the room of a 14-year-old girl, and that she was asleep. He also mentioned that he was going to molest her. My mom asked for the guy's name, and he gave her the name of one of her close friends. My mom said that the friend would never joke like that. The guy said that the girl had a certain type of underwear on. My mom asked the guy where the girl's mother was, and he replied, She gave me permission. My mom tried to get information on the 14-year-old's mother, to which the guy said he wanted to ask my mom questions of his own. Of course, they were sexual questions. My mom said she was going to hang up, and the guy threatened, If you do, I'm gonna touch her. He said this more than once. My mom hung up. A minute or two later, another call. Same guy, but this time, he's moaning. My mom hangs up and calls her friend to see if he called to play a joke on her, to which her friend's wife said that she was at work. My mom called the phone company to see if they could trace the call, as the number was hidden thanks to star 67. After a while, the phone company said they were not authorized to do that. My mom and I went to the police station to report the call. By this point, not only is my mom scared that a 14-year-old girl is being molested, I'm scared about this guy. Could he figure out where we lived? My mom and I waited for close to 20 minutes until a cop saw us. The entire time, the cop seemed uninterested in what we had to say. I know that's hard to believe, but apparently this cop had no time to hear about this disturbing call. My mom is now convinced the guy knew that she cared a lot about children. She worked in child protective for 15 years, and that he just wanted to push her buttons. So creepy pedophile who might have molested a 14-year-old and asked my mom sexual questions? Let's not meet. I went to a private Catholic school from kindergarten to third grade, and while I have fond memories of playing with my friends in the massive yard and climbing trees, I also have a memory of something that bothers me to this day. When I was in the third grade, I started getting anonymous notes in my desk. I remember the first one was written on construction paper. It was wedged between my books. Looking back, it seems more like an adult attempting to mimic a child's handwriting. It said that I was pretty, and they wanted to get to know me better. I asked my friends if they saw anyone at my desk before class started, and they all said no. They all had breakfast at school and I always ate at home, so they were in the classroom much earlier than myself, and they would have noticed. The four of us sat together in a square. Over the next few weeks I received a note about once a week. My best friend teased me saying I had a secret admirer, but the whole thing made me feel... wrong. Sometimes these notes were accompanied by oranges, my favorite fruit, or chocolate. Usually I would find the note, always in my desk, and I would crumple it up when no one was looking and throw it away in the trash can in the hall. I asked my friends many times if they were pranking me. They always denied it. As the months went by, the notes became more sexual and suggestive. 
They were always written on construction paper, but about a month in, the note also had pictures of women in lingerie cut out and pasted to them. The notes were always short and would say things like, You're so sexy. I want to see you in your underwear. I bet you look better. And then progressed to my admirer professing his love and talking about touching me. I was obviously totally freaked out, but I had no idea what to do. I never responded. I just threw them away. My best friend stopped thinking it was funny and seemed just as scared as me. Around this time, I started getting them every day. It was so unnerving. One day I found one while reaching for my spelling book in the back of my desk and it fell to the floor, right in front of my teacher. She bent to pick it up and whatever she read made her eyes go wide. She looked at the note, at me, at the note again, took a deep breath and told me to see her at recess. At recess, she asked me a lot of questions like when I started getting them and if I knew who they were from, etc. I told her everything I knew, which wasn't much. She assured me I wasn't in trouble. She went through my desk and found three more notes. I guess I'd missed a few. And every time she read one, her eyes got wide and her face got red. She ended up calling my parents in for a meeting. I still don't know what they talked about, but the notes finally stopped. Or my teacher was intercepting them. I don't really know. So creepy ass dude who sent graphic, vulgar notes to a seven or eight year old? Let's not meet. Even though I'd love to punch you in the face. This still haunts me to this day. I remember it pretty vividly and I consider myself to have a bad memory. When I was 10, my mother needed to go to Walmart to grab some groceries. Being the hard-headed kid I was, I didn't want to go inside, so she let me stay in the car. I was reading a book and listening to music when all of a sudden an old beat-up tan car parks next to me. I look over, and it's some guy in his 50s. The guy opens up his car door, and he's completely naked, except for a trench coat. I freak out and lock the doors. And he begins to masturbate profusely while staring at me, and I just avoid eye contact. This goes on for about ten minutes until he finishes and leaves. My mom comes back about twenty minutes later and I tell her what happened. She's pissed and flags a security officer. But she didn't know English, so I don't think it got through. My mom never left me alone in the car again until I was in my teens, when I would just stay home. I also never found out any more information about him. Guy that robbed me of my innocence. Let's never meet. My parents split when I was four years old. My dad had a history of substance abuse, thievery, and cheating, and in this small of a town in western Tennessee, he had no chance of keeping it a secret for long. My dad ended up with a lady named Ellen, who had a degenerative disease that eventually took her mobility. Ellen's mother was in one of the two nursing homes in town, and being as I spent every weekend with my dad, I spent a lot of time there. I'd been around sick or elderly people for my entire life at that point, so I'd grown accustomed to helping anyone who's less fortunate than myself. I would help out there with anything I could, feeding residents who couldn't grip silverware, wheeling them back into their rooms, etc. I really enjoyed it there for a while and I think that it was partly due to my siblings being nine and ten years my elders. By the time my parents had me, their marriage was in shambles. My dad was out partying all the time, and my mother was just... tired. 
She did the best she could, but she ended up a single mother working a full-time psychology job and just didn't have enough time to do everything she needed to do. So, needless to say that I enjoyed the attention and praise of the residents at this nursing home. Well, most of them at least. The first time I ever felt uneasy there was when I'd been going for maybe a few months. On this particular day, my dad and I were huddled around the dining table with Ellen and her mother. They frequently discussed things that were boring or beyond my five-year-old comprehension, such as her mother's will in a state. So I was blankly watching the rain pepper one of the floor-to-ceiling windows. When Ellen's mother had had her fill of dinner, I quickly jumped up to take her tray to the dish area. She thanked me with a grin and said, We need more youngsters like you, as she did frequently. I was about halfway through the cafeteria. I was startled by a very raspy voice. I'm done too. I jumped and dropped a fork off the dinner tray. I turned on the spot to find the source of the voice, and that was the first time I'd ever seen Chester. Chester was an elderly Caucasian man. His hair was short, gray, and usually unkempt. I remember thinking about how small he seemed, short and unhealthily skinny. His pale skin seemed to barely stretch over his skull, and I just remember being generally unsettled by this man. I wasn't sure what to do, so I picked up the dropped fork, gave the dinner tray to a cafeteria worker who thanked me with a wink, and sped back to my dad. I refused to look at Chester again as I walked past, but I heard a deep chuckle, and his eyes followed me as far as they could. I stayed glued to my dad for the rest of that visit. I was thoroughly creeped out, but as I was there at least once a week, I continued to help out other residents whenever possible. I quickly became a big favorite with staff and residents alike. Nurses would ask me to do small things for them, who wouldn't love a naive kid doing parts of your job for you while you reap the benefits, and I'd always happily oblige. I actively avoided Chester during my visits. He hadn't tried to speak to me since the first day I'd seen him, but he'd always watch me if I was in a common area. His eyes burned with a hunger that I didn't understand at that age. Now that I'm an adult female, though, I think I could take an educated guess at what he was thinking. One night, the nursing home had a dance for the residents. They played old music that some people danced to, their children or grandchildren that attended the event. I particularly remember a lively, elderly man named John having a wonderful time dancing in his wheelchair. I was enjoying watching the residents in such high spirits and even got to dance with my dad for a while. When he got tired of me standing on his feet, he placed me back on the ground and spun me around a few times before calling it quits. When he began to spin me is when I noticed Chester's eyes glued to me, just a few feet away. I hadn't noticed him before that moment, but he had a menacing look on his face. It was as if the anger in his eyes was burning holes in my skin. I tried to get my dad's attention, but he only mumbled something about stepping out for a smoke and walked away. I should have just ran after my dad, but I didn't. I was so afraid of Chester that I was rooted to the spot. I don't know how long I stood there, staring back at him. I don't even think I blinked until he finally said, laughing, What's the matter with you, girl? You look like you've seen a ghost. I gulped. My five-year-old brain had no idea what to say or do. I kept telling myself to run outside to my dad, but I was so terrified of the dark, and I didn't know exactly where he was at that point. Well, aren't you going to help an old man back to his room? Chester growled. Everything in me screamed that that was the last thing I needed to do. As I stood there deliberating, 
a nurse had told Chester that his medicine was on his bedside table, and that he could go back to his room whenever he was ready. She then hurried off to the opposite side of the room to wheel another resident back to their bed. Chester looked at me as though his prayers had been answered. I see you helping out with a lot of patience here, kid. All I'm asking is to be wheeled back to my bed. At this point, my five-year-old brain had determined that quickly taking Chester back to his room was the lesser of two evils, compared to venturing out into the darkness for my dad. I wanted to get it over with, so I walked quickly over to Chester's wheelchair. I heard him moan softly as I leaned down to unlock his wheel brakes. The walk to his room was short. When we arrived, I barely pushed him inside of his room and turned to walk toward the windows to find my dad. Chester quickly stopped me. I need to be closer to my bed, girl. My medicine and water are over there and I have to take it now. I was terrified to actually go into his room with him, but I'd also seen him walking around from time to time and was afraid that he would just stand up and grab me. I pushed him a bit further towards his bed and nightstand. Closer, he barked repeatedly, until I was so nervous that I almost pushed him right into the nightstand. He growled, almost inaudibly, and then sprung up from his wheelchair quickly. When he stood, he turned around to face me. My horrified eyes looked down to see that he had an erection although I wasn't sure what it was at that age. He began walking toward me with an unbelievably creepy smile on his face. How about a little kiss and a thank you? Or do you like to tuck me into bed? At that point, I bolted. I ran outside and right into my dad, who, I know now, had been smoking marijuana in his car. I jumped into his arms crying and told him that I wanted to leave right away. I had told him about being creeped out by Chester before, but he repeatedly dismissed it and said that my imagination was just running wild. This time though, he calmed me down enough for me to tell him what happened. He had a very sheepish expression at the end of it and sat in silence for what felt like an eternity. My own dad then began to yell at me and said that I should have known better than to enter a male resident's room alone, even though he'd let me do it loads of times before this happened. I honestly think that he was just afraid of my mom finding out what had happened while he was outside getting high. I also found out later that my father was sexually abused as a child, and could never talk about it, which also helps explain but doesn't excuse his shameful reaction. I did tell my mom about the situation, who was upset on many different levels. She kept telling me that she took care of it afterwards, but I still don't know what exactly happened to Chester. My mom also severely limited my father's alone time with me, which eventually changed to visits that were personally supervised by her after a few other ordeals that occurred involving him. So. Creepy Chester who preyed on an innocent, scared five-year-old girl. Let's not meet again. Ever.